so there is a gift of prophecy, but you're not a prophet. A prophet is one of the five-fold ministries of the church. But everyone that I know that is a prophet doesn't want to be one because it costs everything. But you can prophesy. So the word of the Lord should be coming to you. So what I do is I put myself in a place where I can prophesy. I speak forth by the Spirit, and I speak to my world, and I command it to come in line with what Jesus Christ has written about me in my book. That's why I'm doing this word, because, see, if you don't get the word of God, if, you, if it isn't being preached to you, if you're not getting the pure, unadulterated word of God, if it's not, the word of the Lord will never come to you, because you have to have that foundation already in you. The New Testament, a prophet's not going to tell you something new. Now, so that I don't get in so much trouble, I'll just quote Derek Prince. He said, a lot of our services these days are Christian seances. <laughs> okay, so. Well, he's shining on me anyway. I feel really good. Okay, so the word of God endures forever. He's a person. So the, it's, it, in Isaiah, it talks, about, it, t it talks about how the word goes out and comes around 55 and comes back in it, and it, it accomplishes that which was intended. But I have learned that it, to understand the word of the Lord, I have to understand the person from which it comes from. So God's intent for your life is just as important as his word. So when God says something, if he doesn't explain it, then you're still really left in the dark. So here's the thing. You can have a revelation and not have understanding. Because prophets were, were even shown things, and then they're asked, son of man, what do you see? And they don't know what it is. So the prophet says, I don't know, Lord, but you do. And then he explains it. So in this area that, you, that every believer, I believe, is supposed to prophesy, but not every believer is a prophet. So it's just like speaking in tongues. There is an initial sign of the evidence of the infilling of the Spirit, which is speaking in tongues, because I can show you in the book of Acts where every time that people were filled with the Spirit, they spoke in tongues. However... In a public place, the only time that you can use it as, as the gift of the Spirit, which is building up of the body, is when there is someone that has the gift of interpretation to bring it into the known language of the ecclesia or the gathering, the believers. So if I speak in tongues, I can speak unto God. But if I am going to give a message in tongues, then someone must interpret, or I can interpret, which I can interpret my own tongues. So in the church, it's better to prophesy in an intelligible language where everyone is built up than to speak thousands of words in tongues. Because the personal prayer language that Jude, that Jude 20 is talking about is the building up of your most holy faith. That's your personal prayer language. Paul says it, that, that in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2, he says that when you speak in a tongue, your mind does not comprehend. It, does, it isn't fruitful because you're speaking mysteries unto God. But in the church, you can speak in tongues as long as someone is there to interpret it. But Paul said it's better to prophesy. So if you want to speak in tongues, you should pray that you can interpret your tongues as well. And then it's, it's unveiled what God is saying and what you're saying. But if not, it's just between you and him. What I have found is, is that if I understand spiritual things, not just have revelations, 
But if I have an understanding, then I'm, I'm, I'm involved in the governments of God. I'm involved in what God's doing. Whereas, so I'm a child, I'm not a servant. We're children of God. Israel had, was servants. So when the word of the Lord comes to you, it's because you have a base, a foundation. So you should always be in the word of God. Now, here's the thing. The word of the Lord always comes to me, but when I, I'm not in the word, I don't have that manifestation of the word of, of the Lord coming to me. I literally have the word of the Lord coming to me right now. And what I mean by that is, is, is there is a shaft of light that comes down. It's on me right now. My, my top of my head is cooking. It's a shaft of light from heaven, and I get a download. The word of the Lord comes to me. It's coming to me right now. But if I am not based in the word of God, it just becomes like new age. And I know I'm offending everybody. I'm so happy about it. <laughs> but Christianity is not spooky. It's, it, listen, I, I've been with Jesus, oh, you know, one time, 45 minutes. You know, he didn't walk around and, like, get hit and start jerking and, like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, okay. Yeah, Father. Yeah, Father, I'll do that. No. He learned how to walk in it and manage it. <laughs> See how well this goes over? Look at you guys, because you're so used to just people falling out and being weird. But God's not like that. I don't know what that was, but I'm glad it's gone. <laughs> and here's what I saw. I saw that this is for us. A lot of people in this room, there'll come a time when you're at a, a light and it turns green and the Lord's going to tell you, don't go yet. And someone's going to blow through a red light. That's going to happen. There's going to come a time where the Lord, for no reason, is going to tell you something and you need, that's the word of the Lord. And you need to not sit there and, and ask him for a Strong's number and and explain himself. It's, it's ha it happens all the time. Just like just just like things that you already know that I've ex escaped from because the Lord told me. And I wasn't involved in things that I sh like would have been. Didn't make sense at the time, but now it makes sense to me. So. Jesus literally takes your hand and he walks you through this life. He literally does. And when I was in heaven, I didn't know how I was going to convey this when he told me to come back. So he told me just to stand here like I am, and he was going to stand on my right side and just tell me what to say. And so that's what I'm doing right now. It's very uncomfortable because I know what you're thinking, and I understand totally that you're not even sure if I'm for real, a lot of you. And I, that, that, in my human part of me, that bothers me because I totally agree with you. I, I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't want to come to a meeting like this if I didn't know what I, you know. But see, now that I know, I have to do this. I have to give you your medicine, and you have to take it. But it's not popular. But it'll save your life. You have to learn that when the word of the Lord comes to you. You have to obey it because it's going to save your life and it's going to help other people. And I remember when the word of the Lord came to me, just to finish this chapter up and we'll go on to the next one. Um, I told my wife that the word of the Lord came to me. Now, we were in a church in Seattle that, that um, the pastor wanted to have a move of God so badly that he instituted 24-hour prayer. And he, we had a big church you know, where our rent was uh, almost $30,000 a month. And um, so he instituted prayer. So we got to like, what was it like 12 a.m. to 3? 
because no one else would take it. So we were unpaid staff, so we, just, we were helping. So we just, we took it. And so we would show up. And the power of God started to hit, you know, after a while. And then um, in a couple weeks, it hit the youth first in the youth building. And the power of God it had laid out all the youth, and they were shaking and, and crying out to God, you know, repentance and altar time. And so the youth leaders said, let's, let's bring them over into the main service. Oh, man, it went like wildfire. And we went into this move of God for two years where literally every service, there was no one standing at 12 noon on Sunday. Even the ushers were laid out. And we would show up to, for, for, for practice at 9 for the service that starts at 10. The people would line up outside the door to worship with the band in practice. And the, it went to, it started, the service went to where it started at 9. During that time, the Lord said to me, the word of the Lord came to me because the atmosphere was, of heaven was there, just like here. You, the word of the Lord's going to come to you tonight in the service. It will. And you're going to be instructed about something. That's why I'm telling you this. And I was instructed by this little girl, a violin. And because I believe in prosperity and no one else around me did, me and my wife, I just told her, I said, I'm going to buy her a violin. So I went to buy it, and the Lord said, oh, no, no, no. This is going to cost you something. I go, it is. <laughs> but see, it's hard for a rich man to get to heaven because all they have to do is write a check. You'll get this some year. Are you ready for this? He said, no, you're going to fast two meals a day, until, and you're going to take that money, which is about $9 a meal, and you're going to put it into a jar. And whenever you get that, that couple thousand, you're going to buy that violin. So what I did was, for nine months, I fasted two meals a day. And the, the meal that I did eat, I ate red beans and rice. I just took it with me on my trips. And I just cooked red beans and rice. And I put all three meals into the jar. And I bought that girl a violin. When I bought that violin, it came, and I opened it. Big mistake, because it was better than the one I had. And <laughs> it was really cool. On the back, it had the grain looked like a tiger. The, the, it was such good wood, you know. And it had this, these cool stripes in it. And I wrapped it up, and I gave it to the parents. I said, this is for your daughter. The Lord told me to do this, me and my wife to do this. She doesn't know how much it cost me, really. At least I could see my belt buckle after that, you know. <laughs> you know, now, you know, a belt buckle has like a muffled sound. It's screaming, but you can't hear it because it's covered. You know, and now it's like, <laughs> now you can see it. So I hand it to the parents. They couldn't believe it. So the dad comes to me, and he starts crying. He's the pastor. He says, do you know what you just did? And I go, I don't know. I, I just bought your daughter a violin. He goes, did you know that this move of God, that, they were having, that the kids were like laid out all the time? And so this girl, all she would do is she would sit up there in the power of the Spirit every service, and she would just hold out her hand. She says, grab my hand, and people would fall. So she's like holding her hand out. She's grab my hand. I grab it. I, <laughs> and I'm the boy that came back from heaven, and this little girl has like got more power than I do <laughs> because she's yielded. So that's the girl that got the violin. But this is what happened. Because of that move, she, the, the, they would pray with the kids every night before they went to bed. When he would go and ask her, what do you want to pray about? She says, I want a violin. She asked her dad to pray with her for a whole year 
and then she got it. What if I hadn't obeyed? You get it? Okay, can we go on, or do we need to take a break? Um, I have so many stories, but I got to, I got to, okay, covenant, covenant, chapter 8, new covenant, new covenant, chapter 8, verse 49. Okay, this one's a long subject, I'm going to make it very quick, I always say that, and it never happens, but. When we think of covenant, it's really, really an obscure term these days, but it really meant something back. So when you made a covenant, you always made it with someone above you that was more powerful. You wanted the covenant up so that if you got into war, then the people that you covenant with would come as your ally and protect you, and you'd be double the size at least. But see, you gain all the benefits of the person you make a covenant with. So in the old days, tribes would do this and people would do this. They'd make covenants so that it would increase their size. So the United States has allies. And uh, really, a country benefits when they are allies with the United States more than we do. But we get an excuse to trespass, you know, because we, we can put a base in the Middle East if we can get one ally there, then we have access to the Middle East, and then we do this all over the world. But see, for the most part, the smaller countries benefit more by the covenant. Okay, so when you made a covenant with God, like Abraham did, Abraham, it says in chapter 13, I mean, the guy leaves his country doesn't even know where he's going, but God changes his name and says, I'm going to make a nation out of you, okay, so you know the whole story. Here's the thing. By chapter 13, if you read the first verse of chapter 13, I, I can't because you'll get offended, but it says Abraham was very rich. And, um, but I don't say that because if I quote that Bible verse, then, you know, there's that word again. Okay, so that word. Abraham, by following God, making a covenant, he benefited by what God had. And so Isaac benefited, very rich. Jacob, everything he touched. Okay, so the covenant that God made with us benefits us more than it benefits him. He gets his family back, but we get the benefits of being associated with him, okay? So the whole idea about a covenant is that you need to tap in and put demands on that covenant, which means that it's not enough that the thief's caught. He has to pay back, and he pays back sevenfold. Plus, he has to give you the belongings of his house. So, I had this vision, and I realized that it's not enough to just have the thief caught. I have to demand recompense. So what happened was, I'll tell you two stories. And um, the one was, I went down to go to church with, with Kathy, and a white 300ZX. There were only two years that they made this, this body style. So they were being stolen all the time because they were, there were was, was so few of them. Okay, so I went down and it wasn't there. And I'm the boy that came back from heaven. And I can't go to church. And the only car we have has been stolen. But there's no glass broken. So Kathy and I, we grab hands, and the first thing we say is, not only are we getting our car back, but they will be caught in it, and we'll have to pay recompense. So then we call the police, and we file the report. And they said, well, just so you know, this kind of car, the drug lords in Mexico 
actually pay people to come up here and steal. They order the, the car, the, 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 even the color. It's in Mexico already. I go, it was just stolen last night. Sir, it's in Mexico already. I said, well, how could this have been prevented? He said, we found only one way to have this car not stolen. I go, what is it? He goes, sleep in it. <laughs> okay, so two weeks go by. We're calling all the time. You know, have you got our car yet? Because we're expecting it to come back. And they're like, sir, no. And um, so in the third week, we get a call. And the police officer wants to talk to us. And he said, um, I got your car. And uh, he said, there's nothing wrong with it. He said it was backed into a 7-Eleven, which at 2 a.m. is a sign that it's not good. They were hiding the license plate. And uh, so he ran it. There were people in it, so when we approached it, they went to, to get away from the police officer. And, you know, it has a kill switch in it, so it, it locked the doors and shut, shut it down. He said, Kevin, the problem was that they had cut the kill switch and the alarm system when they stole it. So now these people are locked in a car. And the alarm's going off. And he said, it can't be going off. Did you know that that alarm kept going off all night? They, they, they unhooked the battery, and it still was going off. I'm not kidding you. So the people, there was drugs in it, so the people were indicted, and then they had to pay us, make payments for our car to us for years. And we got our car back, and there was nothing wrong with it. And then, and then the judge said, the, the, the attorney, the judge, they said, well, would you like a new alarm system? I think you should have a new alarm system. I said, sure. And I said, well, you know what? It looks like it needs a new paint job, so we're going to give you a new paint job. So they gave us a new paint job. And they redid a whole bunch of stuff, made it brand new again. And then the lady had to pay us the value of the car. And besides that, that's recompense. <laughs> and so I realized that when the devil is caught, like I was talking about last night, when you're not a victim anymore and he's caught, then... So I saw myself when this happened to me just a couple years ago where everything turned in my life. And I, was, I had such a terrible upbringing. And, you know, I had a hard time with, with, with everything because I knew since I was 10 years old what I was called to do. I didn't get saved until I was 19. So I've been walking with the Lord for 39 years, but I've been called for 49. I'm still a youngster now, you know, and I'm, I'm just, I'm just cruising. But I realized when I saw that the devil has to pay me back seven times and he has to give me his furniture. So you have to see yourself on your back porch with his furniture and you're sitting in it. And he can't pay you back seven times. So he has to mow your grass forever. So I see I'm sitting in his furniture, and he's mowing my grass. He's working it off. And I just yell, hey, you missed a spot. <laughs> and you make him pay for what he, you've gone through. This is part of the covenant. Now, it might take you a year to figure out what I just told you, but... You will get there, and you'll remember this. So there is a blood covenant, of course, and we, we know about the blood covenant. We know about what Jesus said. But what you don't know is the discerning of the Lord's body has to do with the communion. And so Judas 
was able to repent up until that last supper when he sat there among the disciples and didn't discern the Lord's body. And when he partook of it unworthily, Satan entered into him. And then Jesus said, whatever you're going to do, do it quickly. Because at that point, he couldn't repent. So Paul says to the Corinthians that when you get together and you have the communion service, he said, wait for everyone and discern what you're doing and discern the body of Christ. Because if you drink of it unworthily, it says that some of you have fallen asleep early. It's not talking about how you feel right now in this service. Falling asleep was a statement concerning death. We just sleep. Then we're resurrected. So Judas didn't discern the covenant that Jesus was making. He made a decision that affected everyone at that table. Do you get it? So when you're a member of a church or a body of believers or friends, you know, like, like, you, like when I do something, it affects my friends. Like I have to be careful because of the people I'm associated with. I mean, I'm ordained under people that I'm, I'm responsible the way I act because their name is on my license. And so when I don't discern the body and I make decisions, then it affects and it brings it bring judgment. Like what, what happened with Judas? I know this is kind of hard, but I have to tell you this, that that is why, that is why, you know, no one wants to touch us. You'll never hear anybody preaching on this. But this is what I was told. Paul said, listen, you know that, that guy that has taken his father's wife? He said, um, the next time you get together and the presence of the Lord is there and my spirit is there with you, talking about Paul, <laughs> no one's going to touch this, see? This is how powerful the church is. This is how powerful the governments of God are. Paul said, when the presence of the Lord is there, when you're in the presence of God together, and I am there in your midst, hand him over to Satan. Now, when's, when's the last time you heard that preached on Christian television? <laughs> this is serious. Because covenant is very important. Boy. Okay, so I'm going to talk louder because you all are fading. I'm going to have to, I'm going to talk like Perry Stone. I'm going to do two hours and a half hour. <laughs> Manifest. Manifest. Because I don't got a lot of time, so come on now, follow me. Here's the red dragon. Here's the Antichrist. And, you know, seven days, seven bulls. Listen, I love that man. I really do. I do. I learn, I really, I watch him all the time. But, but listen. What in the world did Paul just give the permission to that church to do? Well, if you look at the end of this process, he says, okay, the repentance is complete. You can bring them back in. Why? Because, see, Paul said that you're going to bring judgment on the church if you don't expel that person. I'm sorry, Pastor Wayne. I mean, if I stepped over my bounds. Here's, here's the thing. Here is the thing. Is we have to accept everything. And Judas made a decision based on his own agenda and affected the whole table. And then there were 11. And Matthias took the place until Paul came. But that's a whole other story.
Okay, so covenant is something where you covenant up. And so when I was in heaven, I saw that all the music team was supposed to have everything that they ever needed to do what they're called to do. And I saw that that little girl should have a violin, even if it cost me something and my wife something. I saw that I can go without so that somebody can have. It's covenant.